coming to this morning's Multicultural Committee sponsored event, Japanese Americans during World War II, the encampment right here in the United States that occurred with our presenter, the wonderful Dr. James Vigia. Uh, I want you to know that this is the last multicultural event for this year, but please do consider our spring events, and you can look at the homepage for BCC, click on Multicultural Events Calendar, and you will find that we have several upcoming events such as uh, will the real Little Egypt please stand up, uh, including a dance troupe from the Middle East, uh, the Middle East dance troupe, and um, the February African American History events, uh, the March uh, Women's History events as well. So we will welcome you back to those events uh, in the spring. I don't want to take too much time. Uh, I just want to introduce you to Dr. Vigil, uh, who comes to us from as a professor emeritus from the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. He uh, went to Brown University, and he also uh, graduated from Cornell University with a PhD in American history. So he's very knowledgeable on this topic, and uh, I'm sure we're going to gain a lot of info from him today. So please, uh, he, um, what else did I want to say about you? Oh, I wanted to say about all his many articles that he's written in two books, so if anyone is interested in knowing more about that, you can either Google him or you can uh, talk to me and I will get you a bibliography. But please uh, welcome him with me to this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going without a microphone today. <laughs> Uh, during the Great Awakening in the 18th century, there was a, an English evangelist named George Whitfield who came to America. He traveled all through the American colonies leading revival meetings. And, and he would arrive in a town and he'd go out into an empty field and 10,000 people you know, would come to hear him and he'd preach to this crowd of 10,000. And he had such a powerful voice that even the people in the back row <laughs> could hear him. You know. So uh, <coughs> I'm going to try to do that. He, he, uh, he, he would have the audience you know, rolling on the ground, uh, crying and screaming and praising the Lord. Uh, uh, he used to be able to make people go crazy uh, just by pronouncing the word Mesopotamia. You know, uh, it doesn't work as well for me, but uh, I'm, I'm going to do the best I can with my puny little squeaky, naked, unamplified voice. Uh, uh, I want to use that, first of all, to thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Devane for the uh, helpful introduction. I'd like to thank the Multicultural Committee for inviting me uh, here today. I gave this talk last night to a different audience, obviously. Uh, 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 I hope you have in front of you by now uh, the little outline uh, which shows you where we're going. That'll tell you the names and dates and all that stuff so you don't have to bother writing everything down. Uh, when I gave this lecture last night, uh, I have five points you'll see in the outline. I only got to point three. <laughs> so, so I went home last night, poured myself a drink, got back to the computer and started editing. And I cut out a paragraph here and a sentence there, whatever. I hope I've cut it down some. Uh, realistically, I think we'll be lucky if we can get through four points out of the five. Uh, but anyhow, we'll do the best that we can. Now today, I'm going to tell you about camp. All right, camp. Uh, when I was a kid growing up in the 1950s, my mother used to talk about camp. Uh, she would say, well, you know, this is what we used to do when we were in camp, or this happened to us in camp, you know, so it was all welcome everybody. Oh, by the way, if you haven't got a copy of the outline, who, who's got those? Uh, uh, somebody's, somebody's, oh, somebody's at the door, okay, yeah. handing them out, all right, so uh, I hope you all have a copy of that, that little outline. Anyhow, my mother would talk about camp. Uh, and what happened to her in camp. And it always struck me as kind of strange uh, because to me, the word camp 
meant something different. To me, camp was where I went with the Boy Scouts. You know, in, in, in Scouts, camp was where I would sleep in a tent and go swimming in a lake and sit around a fire singing stupid songs. <laughs> camp was fun, you know. Uh, but for my mother, camp was not so much fun. Uh, and that's because for her, camp was concentration camp. Uh, they didn't call it that at the time. Uh, the government called it a relocation center. Uh, the people who lived there just called it camp. Uh, but it was a concentration camp, and I'll tell you why I use that term later on in this lecture. Uh, actually, I'm going to tell you about two different kinds of concentration camps. One is the kind that my mother was in, and you may have, you know, in your courses or just from TV or something, you may have heard about this kind of camp. Uh, the other kind of camp, not too many people know about. It's a smaller kind. Uh, it's much less publicized. Uh, it was a rather nastier sort of place to be than where my mother was. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about this other kind of camp here in America as well. What I want to do, though, is to explain why my mother and her family and 110,000 other people uh, were in these camps. And in order to explain that, I have to... I have to subject you to, subject you to some history. Uh, uh, you got to go back to get some background here. And therefore, let's get into our time machine uh, and set the dial back uh, all the way back to the early years of the Republic, uh, back to 1790, the very first session of Congress. In that year, 1790, Congress passed a law that showed that this was a white man's country, and that gets us to point one in the outline that you have. The law passed in 1790 was the Naturalization Act of 1790, and what this law did is to set up a system, and it, it described the requirements that immigrants had to meet in order to become naturalized, in order to become citizens of the United States. Uh, many of you are familiar with this process. You have to live here a certain number of years. Uh, you have to stay out of trouble with the law. You have to learn English. You have to pass a test. You know, all these requirements you have to meet in order to become a citizen. Well, in 1790, one additional requirement that was passed was that you had to have white skin. All right? Only white people could become citizens of the, could be naturalized as citizens of the United States. Uh, the, the, the phrasing used in the document was free white people. You had to be a free white person uh, to become a citizen. Um, <coughs> in 1790, this law was not aimed against Asians. You know, there were virtually no people moving from Asia to the United States in 1790. Uh, instead, it was aimed against people of African descent, uh, people of Native American, American Indian descent. Uh, some of these people were coming to the country, mostly from the West Indies. Uh, uh, and the go government, the Congress, wanted to make sure that they did not acquire the privileges of citizenship. Uh, if we dial our time machine forward another hundred years uh, to the 1890s, we find that things have changed. Uh, by this time, there are Asians moving to the United States. Lots of Chinese, lots of Japanese coming in in the late 19th century. Uh, by this time, Americans are worried and are concerned about Asian immigration. At this time, there was a lot of talk of what they call the yellow peril. All right, the yellow peril, and that refers to yellow-skinned people, brown actually, uh, from Asia. Hi, Tanya. Uh, uh, there was this, this fear of you know, masses of Chinese and Japanese coming into the country, taking over the country, uh, and this was a horrible thing, uh, and, and we got to do something to stop it. Uh, people, many Americans in, seven, in um, the 1880s, 90s, early 20th century, uh, were grateful for the Naturalization Act of uh, 1790 because at least that prevented all these Asian immigrants from becoming citizens. However, it didn't stop them from coming into the country. All right? uh, uh, so they were still coming to America even though they could not become citizens. 
Now the Japanese mostly settled in two areas of the United States. Uh, the first area was Hawaii, which wasn't even part of the United States until 1898. Uh, but anyhow, from about the 1880s on, they were moving to Hawaii. Very large numbers came into Hawaii. They were picking uh, 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 the sugar cane. They were uh, picking pineapples, doing agricultural labor in Hawaii. Uh, the second place they went was the states of the Pacific Coast. Uh, Alaska, Washington, uh, Alaska was a territory at the time, uh, 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 Alaska, uh, Washington, Oregon, California. Uh, so these are the two main centers of Japanese population in America. Now, a lot of Americans were not happy about this continued immigration, and their attitude is reflected in this picture, which we'll see if I can operate this machine. Oh, by the way, I wanted to thank the technical people here at BCC for setting up all this stuff. And, and uh, you know, I have absolutely no ability with these, <laughs> these gadgets. Uh, so it, it's always an adventure, you know, when I'm trying to operate a computer or thing like this. Well, anyhow, all right, here's a picture uh, I think you can see pretty well from, eight, uh, from 1920, Hollywood, California. Uh, and as you can read, it says, Japs keep moving, this is a white man's neighborhood. All right, uh, that's the attitude a lot of people had, especially in California where there were so many Japanese. Uh, uh, we can't keep you out of the country, but we can keep you out of our neighborhood, and by God, if we can do it, we will uh, keep you out. Uh, if I can... I can the, the, the oh, well before, yeah, this is like 20 years before. Uh, uh, let's see, there's a... Thing I can do here. Uh, okay, you can read that. Maybe Japs keep out uh, the Hollywood uh, member of the Hollywood Protective Association. All right, so we are protecting our city of Hollywood here by keeping out the Japs. We want everybody to know this is a white man's neighborhood. Um, oops. Okay. Uh, this woman and people who agreed with her got their wish in 1924. Uh, in 24, Congress passed an immigration law uh, which banned altogether further immigration from Japan. Okay, so now not only can you not become a citizen, now you can't even get into this country. There were a few exceptions, you know, there, there you know, isolated incidents of a, a person here, a person there, but hardly anybody is able to move from Japan to the United States after 1924. So what this law shows is that in the early 20th century, most Americans did not like Japanese very much and they didn't want to have them around. There are lots of people who agree, agree with this lady here uh, that this is a white man's country and we will do everything we can to keep non-whites out. Despite this lack of welcome, Japanese Americans did pretty well here. You know, uh, they weren't welcomed very much, but they survived and even thrived anyway. After 1924, the population grew through natural increase by having babies uh, rather than through immigration. By 1940, just before the U.S. entered the war, there were about 150,000 people of Japanese descent in Hawaii. And again, Hawaii is where we have the most concentrated population, about 150,000 there. And that constituted more than a third of the population of the Hawaiian Islands. So there were more Japanese than there were native Hawaiians or whites or Chinese or Filipinos or anybody else. They were the single largest ethnic bloc uh, in Hawaii. Uh, in addition, uh, there were almost as many Japanese Americans on the mainland, uh, mostly in California. I think there were something like 100,000 Japanese Americans in California. My parents, however, were not in Hawaii or California. We were further north. My, both my parents were born in Portland, Oregon, raised in Portland, Oregon. Uh, so we're from the great Pacific North <laughs> Northwest. Uh, <coughs> People like my parents, because they were born in the United States, were automatically citizens. All right? Anybody born in the country is a citizen, so they didn't have to go through the naturalization process, uh, and therefore that Naturalization Act of 1790 did not affect them uh, since they were automatically citizens. Uh, by the time the war broke out, 
about two-thirds of Japanese Americans were citizens, right? So uh, of the entire population, it's about one-third Japanese aliens, you know, nationals, uh, and about two-thirds American citizens. Some of the Japanese went into business. Uh, both of my grandfathers uh, were businessmen in Portland, Oregon. Uh, however, most of the Japanese went into farming. You know, that's what they had been doing back in Japan, and when they come to America, they still have their skills as farmers, uh, and so they open up little truck farms, you know, vegetable farms and strawberry farms and things like that. By 1940, almost half the vegetable farms in California were owned or operated by Japanese. Uh, uh, sometimes they couldn't own the farm because there were alien land laws. You know, states like California passed laws saying that Japanese could not own real estate. Uh, but what they could do is lease the land from a white farmer, a white owner. Uh, sometimes what they would do is if they'd saved up enough money to buy a farm, they would buy it and put it in the name of their little kid, <laughs> you know. So you'd have, you know, like a six-month-old child who owns a farm. You know, that's because his parents cannot own a farm, uh, so they put the farm in his name. All right, so, but one way or the other then, they either owned, managed, operated, leased, somehow had control of almost half the vegetable farms, the truck farms as it was called, uh, in California. Now to some people, to some Americans, this is a very bad development. This is a dangerous sign. This is the yellow peril. The Japanese are taking over the farming industry, especially strawberries. Something like 80 percent of the strawberries <laughs> grown in California were grown by Japanese. You know? uh, and to some people this is a cause for alarm. There's a bigger cause for alarm though on the other side of the Pacific Ocean uh, where the yellow peril was something very real and very perilous indeed because of the aggressive imperialistic nature of the Japanese Empire in the, in the 19th, actually throughout the 20th century, but it's kind of peaking in the 30s and 40s, uh, the Japanese um, army is on the march. Japan was forcibly expanding its empire. Uh, in 1937, it invaded China. You know, Americans think that the war began in 1941. Europeans think it began in 1939. But Asians know it began in 1937, you know, when, when the Japanese and the Chinese uh, go to war. In 1940, Japan formed an alliance with Germany and Italy. And then if you know your history, if you're taking a course on World War II or something, you know that uh, the, the, you know, the, the German axis, the Hitler in Germany and Mussolini in Italy, uh, they formed a, a bond and the Japanese joined with them. So it's like the three bad guys all get together on the same team with the Europeans, uh, Germans and Italians conquering Europe and the Japanese conquering Asia. Uh, uh, something very evil is happening around the world. Under those circumstances, it's quite natural that be Americans became quite alarmed. Uh, they became increasingly fearful of Japan. The government, U.S. government, <laughs> suspected that the United States would be going to war with Japan soon. I mean, they, they pretty well knew it was just a matter of time before we get into it uh, with the Japanese. And they wanted to prepare for that eventuality. What are we going to do when we go to war with the Japanese? And in particular, they're wondering, what about all those hundreds of thousands of Japanese Americans, all those people of Japanese ancestry who are here in this country, mostly in Hawaii and California, uh, whose side will they be on <laughs> if a war breaks out between us and their mother country? And there's a lot of worry they might choose the wrong side. So, uh, the FBI uh, gets busy. You know, that's what the FBI does, they investigate uh, crimes or possible crimes, problems. Uh, so the, the, the President Roosevelt orders the FBI uh, to look into this matter uh, of how loyal will the Japanese be if you know, we have a war, what will we do about it, things like that. The FBI compiled a list that's what the FBI does. We didn't have the NSA in those days. <laughs> All we had was the FBI, and they did their best, uh, and they made up these lists. Uh, and one of the lists was all the Japanese, people of Japanese ancestry who might potentially be dangerous, people we can't count on, people who might be working for the other side if we have a war. Uh, well, who's on the list? How do you get onto this list? Well, for instance, uh, 
people who had spoken favorably of uh, Japan and Germany. Uh, if you had uh, gone to a meeting of, you know, say a Japanese uh, fraternal organization and you got up in front of the audience like this and, and you gave a speech saying, someday Japan and Germany will rule the world, you know. Meanwhile, in the back row, there's some guy taking notes, you know, <laughs> and it's not for a test in his college course, it's the FBI guy writing down your name and your address and what you said and stuff like that because this is all going into your dossier uh, at the FBI. Uh, uh, people like... Uh, People who traveled to Japan, uh, 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 travel agents, for instance. You know, part of your job as a travel agent is to go to the places where you're sending people. So if you travel to Japan and go to all the hotels in Tokyo and stuff, and then come back, uh, uh, your name is going to go on the list. Business people, if you're involved in the import-export trade, if you travel to Japan to try to make a sale, or if Japanese salesmen come to your plant here in the United States and you try to sell them something, uh, if you have that kind of contact with Japanese you're going on the list. How come? Well, how do we know that you're just an innocent travel salesman or businessman? Uh, you might be a spy. You know, that person you're meeting might be the contact. You know, you might be part of this big intelligence network gathering information, transmitting it back to Tokyo, whatever. So we don't know that you're a spy, but you might be a spy. You have an opportunity to be a spy, uh, and therefore we're going to put your name down on the list. Uh, people who led organizations, Japanese organizations, like if you led one of those fraternal organizations, if you were a minister or a priest uh, in a Buddhist temple or Shinto temple or something like that, uh, uh, if you were a spiritual leader of a Japanese community in America, uh, if you were a martial arts instructor, if you taught judo or karate or something like that, uh, and you had a lot of students, yeah, who, who knows? You might be, you know, teaching those students how to kill Americans or something. Yeah, in the event of war, they might put their martial arts to, to bad uses here, so we don't trust people like that. Uh, uh, so anyhow, there's all kinds of ways uh, that you can get your name put on uh, this FBI list. All right. In short, then, anybody who either had close ties to Japan or who was some kind of community leader, uh, these were the people that the government was watching. All right? They had their names, they had their addresses, uh, they knew who to pick up when the time came. That is how the situation stood on December 7, 1941. On that day, Japanese airplanes launched from aircraft carriers bombed the American naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Uh, they sank half the battleships in the Pacific Fleet. They killed 2,400 men. Uh, the next day, the United States declared war on Japan. Now is when that list came into play. You know, the FBI its work did not go in vain. <laughs> they had all these names and they had their addresses and they knew who they were looking for. So boom, you know, federal agents spread throughout the country or at least through the Japanese communities uh, rounding up people on the list. Uh, not only people on the list but also some other, a lot of other people too. They're, they're rounding up hundreds and hundreds of people. In two weeks, uh, they had put together, they had rounded up about 2,200 people, all right? So right after Pearl Harbor, very quickly, they get all the people on the list, plus several hundred more. Uh, and the government put them in special prisons, which were run by the Justice Department. The formal name for these prisons was Alien Enemy Detention Centers. This is on point two here on your, your outline. Uh, and these alien enemy detention centers belong to a type of prison called internment camps. So I want to go into a little bit of detail explaining that word internment. There's a couple of different ways people use the word. Kind of the loose common usage it just means any kind of, you know, process where you round up a beat bunch of people and, and put them behind bars. Uh, but there's also a more a narrower, more technical definition, which I think is more useful because it is more exact. And this is the legal definition. Uh, in international law, internment is a technical term, uh, and it refers to the incarceration of people from an enemy country during wartime. You know, when you go to war, uh, you, you, you're nervous about these people who, you know, came from, you know, uh, uh, and are 
citizens of or subjects of uh, the country you're fighting against. You know, the first use of internment in American history uh, was in the War of 1812, you know, uh, when we went to war against England. Uh, we, we interned English citizens who happened to be in, in, you know, English subjects of the British Crown who happened to be in the United States when the war broke out. All right, uh, so this is something that happens all the time uh, during wars. Uh, internment is considered a legitimate act of war. You know, when you go to war, it is only reasonable uh, the, that you don't trust people who, you know, are citizens of the enemy country, and therefore it is reasonable that you round them up and put them in camps and keep them where they can't do you any harm. For example, during World War II, one group who got interned in America uh, were Japanese diplomats. Uh, when the war broke out, Japan had an embassy in Washington, it had consulates in New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles, Honolulu, a bunch of places. Uh, so, you know, they had, you know, the, the diplomats themselves, all the staff, you know, all the clerks and secretaries and, you know, everybody uh, uh, who were people from Japan, uh, nationals of Japan. Uh, well, when the war broke out, uh, one of the first things the U.S. did is swoop down on all these consulates in the embassy in Washington, arrest everybody, and send them to prison. Uh, they were sent to prison in New Mexico. Santa Fe, New Mexico was one of the internment camps, uh, and that's the place where most of the Japanese diplomatic corps uh, was sent for a while. Actually, uh, during the war, a couple of years later, uh, they were exchanged for American diplomats who had been interned by the Japanese. So we had a swap, you know, we'll give you your diplomats back if you give us uh, ours back. Uh, and so that was done later on during the war. But at the start anyway, <coughs> uh, the, the diplomatic corps was sent to Santa Fe. The Japanese Americans, however, those 2200 I told you about, were not sent to Santa Fe. Uh, most of them got put in stockades, you know, military prisons, on army bases in Montana and North Dakota, Fort Missoula in Montana, Fort Lincoln in North Dakota. Uh, you know, military bases have brigs, you know, they have ready-made prisons, you know, they got space, they got where you can put people, and so if you need to put people somewhere right away, uh, you, you, you know, it's convenient to put them in a, in a military jail. Now these 2,200 prisoners were not a cross-section of the Japanese American population. They're not your typical Japanese American. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, they were community leaders. They were people who had had a lot of contact with Japan, you know, who went to Japan or entertained visitors from Japan. And this meant that they fell into two categories. First of all, they were all men. Right? The Japanese community was traditional here, and, and uh, the men uh, were the ones who dominated society. Uh, the people who gave speeches, led organizations, were priests in churches, uh, people who traveled abroad, uh, people who owned businesses, things like that. They were all men. All right? So these, these can internment camps then are going to have male populations. Secondly, the prisoners were old or at least middle-aged. Uh, in this way, too, the Japanese were traditional. They didn't let 20-year-olds <laughs> run society. It was the elders who ran society. And so it was the people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s uh, who were the leaders. And therefore, they're the ones who are going to get rounded up and sent off to jail. In the alien enemy detention centers, the average age of the prisoners was 60. Okay, so people about my age uh, were, were, were the ones who were going to prison. That's why, uh, well, because they were that age, because they were 60 instead of 20, uh, all, virtually all of them were aliens. And that's the, that is to say they were immigrants from Japan. <clears throat> they would not be the American citizens born here in the U.S. because those were too young. Uh, uh, so the people you know, getting sent to these camps are almost all uh, citizens of Japan. That is why <clears throat> these camps could be accurately called alien enemy detention centers uh, because the people were aliens. They were 
real Japanese, they were citizens of Japan, not of the United States. That's why these could be called internment camps, because remember, technically internment is for foreigners, uh, and they are technically foreigners. They may have lived here for 50 years, you know, <laughs> they may want to be American citizens, but they can't become American citizens, they, therefore they will spend their whole life as aliens, uh, and because they are aliens, when we say we intern them, uh, that terminology is correct because they are foreigners from the other country, the enemy country, during wartime. Uh, <clears throat> now the people in these camps had it tough. Um, prison is never a pleasant place to be, uh, but for them it was even a little worse than it was for most people. Uh, the housing was very crude, the food was bad, and it wasn't Japanese food. <laughs> you know, you're not going to get rice and pickled vegetables for breakfast or something like that if you're at Fort Missoula in Montana. Moreover, <clears throat> the prisoners were almost never accompanied by their families. All right, uh, they had to leave their families behind, and so all these 60-year-old men are kind of all by themselves with a bunch of strangers out there in Montana or North Dakota. <clears throat> the camps are in the middle of nowhere, uh, and that means it is virtually impossible for your family even to come visit. You know, uh, I'm not even sure they were allowed, but if they were allowed, you know, how do you get to Missoula, Montana, or, or, or uh, Bismarck, North Dakota? Uh, so that what happened is these guys would go three or four years without seeing their families, without having visitors, you know, so it's, it's, it's very lonesome out there. Also, a, a problem for them is their change in status. You know, uh, back in the real world, they had been elders, they had been leaders of the community, they had been respected, they had been honored. Well, <laughs> A prisoner in jail is not respected, is not honored, you know, uh, 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 I won't use the word, but you know how you're going to be treated uh, when you are in a military prison. So from a psychological point of view then, uh, the Department of Justice camps were extremely damaging. You know, the, the people who went to them had it really hard and it showed. I've read a, some memoirs, I, over the like, last week, or a couple of weeks ago, I read a, a novel about this subject. Uh, but you know what would happen is, is there'd be some family in you know, Seattle or Los Angeles or whatever, and one night, you know, the FBI comes knocking on the door and they grab dad uh, and they haul him off, dad or grandpa, or, you know, and they haul him off, he doesn't even have time to <laughs> get his shoes on, uh, and they take him away to jail and you don't see him for four years. Uh, and then when he finally comes back after the war is over, uh, he's not the same, you know, he's broken. Uh, he, you know, he, when, when they took him away, he was full of energy and vitality and enthusiasm, but by the time he comes back, he's nothing. You know, he doesn't even want to leave the house, he doesn't talk to anybody, he doesn't say anything. Uh, uh, a lot of people had their lives really ruined uh, by this experience. All right, <clears throat> so those are the 2200. As they were being round, rounded up and put away in jail, the government wondered, what should we do about all the rest? All right, there are still hundreds of thousands of them out there. Are they a threat? Therefore, the United States launched two more investigations uh, to try to determine the potential loyalty of the remaining Japanese populations. One of these investigations was led by the Office of Naval Intelligence intelligence, the ONI. Uh, the Navy was involved because, you know, the war was be against Japan was being fought mainly by the Navy. You know, all those battles out there in the Pacific, those are naval battles. Uh, the Navy is worried that if Japanese Americans are saboteurs and spies, um, they will be trying to sink American ships, you know, and passing on information to the Japanese submarines about, you know, where the freighters are going and how to blow them up and stuff like that. Uh, so the Navy, more than any other branch of the, of, of the service, at this point anyway, is concerned with what the Japanese are up to. Um, the Navy investigation was led by a lieutenant commander named Kenneth Ringel. Uh, commander Ringel might have been this country's leading expert on Japanese espionage. He knew more about Japanese spies than anybody except the Japanese spies. 
<laughs> of all the Americans he knew the most. Uh, that's because he had been investigating them, uh, breaking their spy rings. Uh, that's what he did for a living. Uh, in, in early 1941, before the war um, broke out, he broke up a Japanese spy ring based in Los Angeles. It was a real cloak and dagger so, sort of thing. They, they broke into the Japanese consulate, busted open a safe, got out the contents of the safe. They found lists of names, and so they went and rounded up these people on the list. Uh, uh, so anyhow, it's kind of Nixonian, you know. Uh, uh, but anyhow, uh, this guy, even if you might find his means a little bit shaky, he knows what he's doing and he knows who the bad guys are uh, and he knows how you get them. All right, so he was the logical choice uh, to lead this investigation. Um, because he knew so much about the subject already, he was able to produce uh, his report very quickly. In fact, you know, as government investigations go. This was amazingly fast. On December 20, he submitted his report, you know, so less than two weeks uh, after Pearl Harbor. Already we have the Ringel report uh, coming in. Uh, he submits it to his commander, the Chief of Naval Operations. What's he say? Well, Ringel concluded that the Japanese problem, as he put it in capital letters, had been exaggerated. Uh, he said that actually there is no problem. We don't really need to worry, at least not very much, about Japanese Americans. Uh, he estimated that in the entire country there were only about 300 Japanese Americans who were a threat, you know, who might be working for the bad guys, for the other side. And of those 300, most of them are in jail already. You know, they were swept up, you know, among that 2,200 in, in the first round of arrests. Uh, the remaining ones who weren't swept up, we have their names, we know who they are, we can get them anytime we want. Uh, 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 and therefore, uh, you know, the problem has already been taken care of. Of the remaining hundreds of thousands of Japanese, Commander Ringel said they were loyal, uh, he said they would remain loyal as long as we treated them well. You know, if you treat them with justice, uh, if, if you don't fire them from their jobs and, you know, send them off to prison and call them names and give them a hard time, as long as you treat them fairly, uh, they will remain loyal to this country uh, and, and therefore there's nothing to worry about. That was the first investigation. The second investigation was conducted by the FBI and it was headed by its director, J. Edgar Hoover whom many of you have heard about in other contexts already. Hoover uh, issued a secret six-page report. I think it was in January of 42. He took a little bit longer than Commander Ringel. But he agreed with the Ringel report that the remaining Japanese Americans were not a threat. Uh, to arrest them, Hoover concluded, would be, and I quote, utterly unwarranted utterly unwarranted. There is absolutely no reason to, address, uh, to arrest uh, the vast majority of the Japanese American population. Hoover and Ringel agreed on one crucial point, and that is that the government should arrest people only on the basis of individual behavior. You know, if some person does something suspicious, like, you know, giving a pro-Japanese speech or traveling to Tokyo or, or even t teaching a judo class or something, okay, then we can arrest him because he's done something that makes us suspect that maybe he's up to mischief. But if he hasn't done anything at all, you know, as an individual, if he hasn't done anything, then we ought to leave them alone. Hoover and Ringel said that sh people should not be rounded up just because of the nationality or race that they possessed, not because of where, you know, what country their parents or grandparents came from, uh, but only if they as individuals had done, done something suspicious. All right. So those, those, that's what the Navy and the FBI had to say. Now you might think that this would be the end of the story. All right, case closed, no problem, let's, let's go fight the war. Uh, but that's not the way it turned out. Uh, the story was just beginning. Uh, and the reason why the story continued is because of public opinion, how people felt uh, in America. In 1942, a lot of Americans hated the Japanese. Oops. Okay. Try this. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, this is a propaganda poster from 1942, uh, widely circulated during the war. This is the enemy, 
And, and you see this uh, Japanese soldier with some other soldiers in the background. This is what the enemy, this is what the Japanese do. Look, you see people hanging here. Uh, you see cities burning. You see a guy on his knees getting bayoneted by a Japanese soldier. And here in front, of course, you have this white woman being raped by a Japanese uh, soldier. Uh, white or at least very <laughs> light complexioned anyway. Uh, this, this is what the Japanese do. This is what we can expect from the Japanese. This is uh, the nature nature of the Japanese. And notice the posture of the soldier. You know, he's not standing up straight. He's kind of hunched over. Uh, this is a simian posture. This is how monkeys look. This is how monkeys walk. These people are not even human. They're not people. They're, they're monkeys. They're animals. They're beasts. You know, and that's why they go around raping and killing and stuff because, you know, they're, they're these vicious, vicious animals. Uh, and this is what it means to be Japanese. Um, Oh, yeah, let's see. Uh, oops, not that much. Uh, how about? Okay. Um, all right, so, you know, what can you expect from, from people like this? And it's not just the people in Japan. It's anybody who belongs to the Japanese race. Even if they leave Japan, come to America, even if they were born in America, they still belong to the Japanese race, uh, and therefore they're going to be like this. I mean, a monkey. You know, a monkey is always a monkey, and its, it's children are going to be monkeys, and its grandchildren are going to be monkeys, and they're always going to be like this, and there's no way they're going to change, and there's nothing that anybody can do about it. One influential spokesman for this anti-Japanese crowd was an army general named John DeWitt. Uh, Lieutenant General DeWitt was in charge of the military zone along the west coast. Uh, uh, the, the whole country was divided up into a bunch of different military zones and DeWitt commanded that Pacific Coast region. Uh, his favorite saying, which he repeated again and again to newspapers, was a Jap's a Jap, all right? Nice, simple saying. It's easy to memorize. Uh, he believed that when Japan went to war against the United States, any person of Japanese descent was bound to side with Japan. It's inevitable. Uh, this was true, even if the person was born and raised in the United States. He said, quote, the Japanese race is an enemy race. All right, so we're not just warring against the Japanese government or the Japanese nation. We're warring against the Japanese race. So that means all the Japanese scattered around the world are still members of the Japanese race. And those are the enemy. This is the enemy. They're all like that. And we don't want people like this uh, to be out on the loose. Uh, lots of Americans agreed. Uh, Gen uh, General DeWitt never said a kraut's a kraut or a wop's a wop. You know, he thought that you know, people could move from Germany and become good American citizens. They could move from Italy and become good American citizens. I mean, look who's playing center field for the New York Yankees in 1942. It's Joe DiMaggio. You know, his parents came here from Italy. Well, we're not going to put Joe DiMaggio in jail, even if we're Red Sox fans. Uh, 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 you know, so, so Germans and Italians they can become good, loyal Americans, but Japanese belonging to this different race cannot. Yes? I heard some, some Italian-Americans were interned. Yeah, uh, they would be going to that first kind of camp I told you about. If they were, you know, native-born Italians or Germans, or if they were somehow very active, you know, in some, you know, well, like the German-American Bund, you know, was this uh, fraternal kind of Nazi organization, so these Germans and those Italians and stuff, uh, individuals would get rounded up. I forget the exact number, but I think it was something like, you know, 3,000 Germans and 1,000 Italians or something were also put in camps. Uh, but there was never the massive uh, roundup that you had with the Japanese. Of course, there were a lot more German Italians and Italian Americans, uh, uh, German Americans, Italian Americans, than there were Japanese Americans. It wasn't, it wouldn't be feasible to round up all the tens of millions of people with German or Italian ancestry. Uh, but they didn't want to anyway. All right, so we have then this massive, powerful racial prejudice. But wait, there's more. Uh, there's also an element of simple greed. Uh, as I said, out there on the West Coast, Japanese owned a lot of farms, owned a lot of businesses, and white people wanted to take them over. Uh, one who admitted this was the manager of an association of white farmers in California. He said, we're charged with wanting to get rid of the Japs for selfish reasons. We might as well be honest, 
we do. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you know, if we get rid of them, then we can take over their farms, take over their business, it'll all be ours, you know. And, and so he was, he, he got to give him credit for honesty anyway. He, came, he was out front about that. He said that we stand to gain something from removing the Japanese. Fundamentally, then, the removal of the Japanese Americans was not a military decision, but a political one. The main reason for the removal was not fear of spying or espionage. Instead, it was this. It was hatred and contempt for anybody of Japanese origin. Now, this is all nicely revealed, I think, in a political cartoon that was published in newspapers on February 13, 1942. Uh, let's see if this will work. And this is what you have on the back of that outline that we handed out waiting for the signal from home. Now what's neat about this cartoon is that it reveals both kind of motives for the removal. It shows both the official, ostensible, uh, spoken reason for, for rounding up the Japanese, but it also, if you interpret it, if you pay attention, you can also see the real, more fundamental, uh, more powerful reason, which is kind of secret, except it's not too secret if you think about it. The official reason is national security. What's happening here, uh, I, uh, let's see, I might blow this up a little bit. Uh, <coughs> uh, all along the Pacific coast here, there are all these tens of thousands of, of Japanese, uh, and uh, they're lining up to, to receive their little bricks of TNT, high explosives, uh, you know, which they can then take out and use to you know, blow up ships and railroad tracks and, and uh, munitions dumps and power lines and, and whatever. Uh, they are the Honorable Fifth Column, or as we say in Japanese, Honorable Fifth Column. Uh, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that term, Fifth Column. We don't hear that very much anymore. Uh, it comes from the Spanish Civil War of the 1930s. Uh, during the Spanish Civil War, the rebels, Franco and his guys, had four columns of troops marching on Madrid, the capital. Uh, but one of the, uh, his generals boasted that we also have a fifth column, uh, which is inside Madrid. In other words, there are people who are on our side, and as soon as we appear at the walls, they will rise up and attack the defenders uh, and help us over, overthrow the Republic, overthrow the city of Madrid. Uh, the fifth column then uh, consists of traitors, you know, people working for the enemy who will help the enemy uh, destroy our defenses uh, and help the enemy overwhelm us. All right, so, so when this, this cartoon says that the Japanese are a fifth column, uh, the Japanese are like those uh, you know, Spaniards uh, who are inside the stronghold, uh, but once they get, get a chance, they will uh, attack the defenders of the stronghold and help the invaders uh, win the war. Uh, all right, so the official ostensible reason then uh, for the removal of the Japanese is to get rid of this fifth column uh, to prevent them from blowing things up, uh, uh, and that's why we have to uh, put them in camps. However, what this cartoon also reveals is the unofficial reason, the sort of secret reason, uh, which is racial prejudice. I mean, look at these Japanese here. You know, there's a horde of them. You know, this is the yellow peril. You know, there's not just a couple of them. There are, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of them all along the Pacific coast. And look at them. They're all the same. They're, you know, a, a Jap's a Jap. You know, every one of them is the same. Uh, they all have that same goofy smile <laughs> on their face. And what does that show? That shows they're treacherous. You know, Orientals, you know, are always devious and sly and treacherous. They cannot be trusted. Uh, they're smiling because they want us to think that they're our friends. You know, they want us to, uh, to like them, to trust them. Uh, but, you know, what are they doing? They're getting TNT. They're getting bombs. They're going to kill us. You know, as soon as they get the chance, they will rise up and destroy us. Uh, uh, this is why we have to get rid of them first. And look what they're doing. They're waiting for the signal from home. Uh, they're looking to Japan. That is home. You know, even if they've lived here for 50 years, even if they were born and raised in Los Angeles, uh, that's not their home. Their home is Tokyo. Their home is Japan. You know, and they are always loyal to Japan. They are never loyal to the United States. Uh, and this is why uh, we have to get rid of them.
Now, one interesting thing about this cartoon, which some of you have noticed already, uh, is the name of the author, or the artist, you know, down in the lower corner there, Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss, how could you do this to him? <laughs> you know, in later years, you know, he would be this beloved author of children's books. You know, he would write about the cat in the hat and the Grinch who stole Christmas and, and the green eggs and ham and stuff like that. Well, here in 1942, he's doing political cartoons and he's, he's showing the yellow peril. You know, he's showing the menace that the Japanese uh, pose uh, 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 once they're here in America. Uh, And this kind of shows that, you know, I, I like Dr. Seuss. I like Franklin Roosevelt. They're good guys, you know. Uh, but good guys sometimes do bad things, at least in my opinion, bad things. Uh, and here's Dr. Seuss in 1942 uh, doing something which I think he probably regretted uh, later in his life. Uh, now, the man who had to decide what to do about the Japanese was not uh, Dr. Seuss. It was, of course, Franklin Roosevelt, the president. Um, uh, FDR consulted his advisors and he got mixed responses. Uh, his attorney general was not too crazy about removing the Japanese. His name is Francis Biddle, you don't have to know that. But the attorney general said, well look, I've got this report from the FBI. It says that the Japanese are not a threat, you know, so there doesn't seem to be any real reason uh, to do anything about this. Plus, it's, you know, not very nice to force people out of their homes. It force, if they're in school, you force them out of school. If they have a job, you force them out of their jobs, and you round them up and you put them in prison. Uh, and, you know, we don't have any crime that we're charging them with. You know, it's not like we have, you know, reason to believe that they actually engaged in espionage or, or, or sabotage or anything like that. Uh, so constitutionally, I don't know if we can do this. Can you put people in jail and hold them in jail even though they're not charged with any crime? You know, there's this thing called habeas corpus, you know, that the, the authorities are supposed to have some kind of reason to hold you in prison, but uh, uh, we don't really have a reason except that your ancestors came from Japan. Uh, so the, the Attorney General was not, not too crazy about this program. On the other hand, you have the military people. Uh, the Secretary of War or the Secretary of the Navy both said, well, forget all that stuff, it has to be done. You know, it's not nice and it's maybe legally dubious, but, you know, we're defending the country and in, in the interest of national defense, uh, anything <laughs> is, uh, is, is allowed. Uh, apparently, I don't know whether they hadn't read the Ringel report and the FBI report or whether they read it and just didn't believe it or whatever, uh, but they continued to insist that, uh, uh, the, uh, that Dr. Seuss was right here, uh, that the Japanese did pose a peril and therefore uh, needed to be dealt with. On February 19, 1942, President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066. Uh, this was six days after this cartoon was published. Uh, the order gave the Army permission to remove Japanese Americans from their home. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with this concept of, of executive orders, but that's when you don't go to, the president doesn't go to Congress and ask him to pass a law. Instead, he just uses his own authority as the chief executive, or in this case, as commander-in-chief of the armed forces. Uh, he uses that power uh, to, to order uh, the roundup of the Japanese. Uh, he sent a message to the army uh, that uh, they were now allowed, if they chose to do so, uh, to remove the Japanese Americans from their zone. You know, each, each zone is commanded by a general. Each general can decide whether he thinks it's necessary to get rid of the Japanese. Uh, general DeWitt, in command of the Pacific Zone there, wasted no time once he got the go-ahead. He ordered the Japanese to leave. Uh, he began the evacuation in March of 42, and he finished the process in June. So from March to June of 1942, uh, we have kind of neighborhood by neighborhood, the trucks rolling up and people being forced to get in and being taken off to camp. Uh, and that gets us to our next picture. Okay, this is uh, registration in uh, San Francisco in 1942, uh, before they 
put, sent you off to camp, they had to get your name and address and stuff like that. So, you know, as soon as the war broke out, everybody, every Japanese American had to register. Uh, and then, you know, when the time came to remove you, they would go down the list of the registries and, uh, and make sure that everybody who was in, on the list uh, got put in a truck and taken off to camp. So here they're signing up to register in, in San Francisco. I like this picture because it forms a contrast with the one we saw previously, the cartoon by Dr. Seuss. You know, in both pictures we have Japanese Americans in a line, <laughs> but, but what a difference this is. For one thing, uh, remember Dr. Seuss's picture was all men and they all looked exactly alike. Well, here we have a mixed group. You know, you have an older man, a younger man, you have women, you have little kids. Uh, uh, here you have actual people. <laughs> you know, this is what real people look like. This is not a cartoon stereotype. Uh, every single one of them is different. Uh, you have this sense of these are not apes, these are humans, you know, and you know, maybe some of these guys are traitors, I don't know, uh, but probably most of them aren't. You know, certainly these little kids probably don't look terribly dangerous to me, uh, and yet all of them have to register. All of them are going to be taken away to camp. Uh, Did they know that they were going to be taken at that point? Uh, they were pretty sure, yeah. Yeah, because, you know, they wouldn't be registering you just out of curiosity, you know. Uh, uh, now, DeWitt's command extended over the Pacific coast. He had Washington, Oregon, uh, or actually the western half of Washington, the western half, you know, west of the Cascades in Washington, Oregon. He had all of California, and for some reason, southern Arizona. I don't know uh, why, you know, since Arizona isn't on the coast, but he had that too. Um, so from all of these re regions then people would be taken away. But the removal of Japanese Americans did not happen in Hawaii. Right? And that's really kind of interesting and kind of important. Uh, in Hawaii there was a different army general in command and he said no way. <laughs> he said we're not going to do it, that's stupid. You know because think about it. 35% of the people in Hawaii are Japanese American. You can't take 35% of the people and put them in prison. You know, you don't have enough people left to guard them. You know, the economy would crash, society would crash. It's not feasible. Uh, and as a result then, uh, the Japanese in Hawaii were allowed to stay there. Now I find this really ironic and almost funny uh, because Hawaii is the place where if the Japanese had been up to mischief, if they had been spies and saboteurs, Hawaii is the place where they could have done the most damage because that's where the war is being fought, you know. Uh, uh, and that's the one place where they didn't have to leave, you know, so they, they were, were left alone. Therefore, it's only the Japanese from the mainland who go off to camp. Altogether, there are about 110,000 of them. Some sources say 120,000. I'm not sure why this discrepancy. Either way, it's pretty close. Uh, uh, this was the largest forced migration in all of American history. You know, you can look through all history, American history, and not find a, an instance where the government drove more people out of their homes and forced them into camps uh, than in 1942. Now, General DeWitt's original plan to remove the Japanese consisted of two parts, two steps. Uh, step one was to evacuate them from, from their homes along the west coast, uh, and step two was to relocate them by dispersing them throughout uh, the rest of the country, send them to some place where they you know, won't have much opportunity uh, to engage in spying and sabotage. Executive Order 9066 gives commanders of military zones the authority to exclude Japanese Americans from their zone, but it doesn't say anything about where to put them after <laughs> you've excluded them. All right? So it says get rid of them, and then it's up to you to find a place uh, to put them. Uh, now, General DeWitt, you know, thought that, well, we'll just send them to, you know, Arkansas or, or, or Arizona or, no, not Arizona, no, maybe uh, uh, Iowa or someplace like that. However, as DeWitt worked on the removal, uh, he ran into fierce opposition to part two. Uh, and that's because leaders, political leaders of other states vehemently objected. They didn't want any Japanese coming into their state. You know, uh, I don't care what you do with them, just, you know, they're like that woman in the picture. You know, <laughs> Japs keep moving, keep out of my state, out of my neighborhood, this is a white man's neighborhood. We don't want you anywhere in our towns or our cities. Uh, 
they were afraid that once the war was over, uh, all those Japanese who had been sent to, you know, the Midwest or something would stay there, you know, and we don't want them to stay there. We want them to go back to where they came from, go to Japan, go anywhere, just get out of here. Uh, uh, and so we will do everything we can to prevent uh, the Japanese from being relocated in our neck of the woods. Jim, were they given an option for deportation? Uh, a few were, th these are the ones who caused some kind of trouble, uh, you know, who were objecting and going on strike and stuff. Uh, sometimes they were deported or at least uh, sometimes offered a choice, sometimes they didn't have a choice, they were just sent. Um, well, anyhow, because of all this resistance to, you know, allowing Japanese to scatter throughout the country, General DeWitt had to change his plan. Uh, the Japanese would not get to go east and settle wherever they wanted. Uh, instead, they would be put in camps, all right? So, you know, because if, if you're in a camp, then the people in the rest of the state or whatever don't have to deal with you. You're not anywhere near them. You're not inside of them. You take a camp out in the middle of the desert. Indian reservations, they loved Indian <laughs> reservations because those were already out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so you put them there, you put them in a camp, and the people in the rest of the state are not too bothered uh, by that. All right, so that's why we have relocation centers. Now that term, relocation center, is a euphemism. Uh, it's a word with Greek roots, meaning good speech. A euphemism makes something sound better than it actually is. All right, you engage in euphemism when you want to kind of cover something up and make it sound not too bad. Well, relocation center is a euphemism. It doesn't sound too bad. Uh, what's wrong with relocation? I mean, 20-something uh, years ago, my wife and I relocated uh, from Easton, Massachusetts to Dartmouth, Massachusetts, so I could be closer to my place of work. Uh, so relocation is voluntary. Relocation is actually, you know, kind of a step up or uh, something that I wanted to do is, is good. Well, uh, that's not what happened to my mother. <laughs> uh, she was not relocated voluntarily. She didn't have a choice in the matter. It was not helpful to her career. Uh, uh, that's why I think a more accurate term for these centers, uh, more accurate than relocation center, is concentration camp. Now this phrase does not sound nearly as nice as relocation center, but that's because concentration camps are not nice. A concentration camp is where you can find people that you don't trust. Uh, you start with people you, who are scattered all over an area and, and you don't know where they are and you can't, lo and you can't control them. Uh, you round them up. Uh, you con that's where the term concentration comes from, camp comes from. You concentrate this population, put them all together in a small place. You build a fence around them, you put barbed wire on top of the fence, you build towers or along the perimeter, you station sentries with submachine, Thompson submachine guns. Uh, you even sometimes have tanks rolling around the outside of the perimeter to make sure nobody escapes. Uh, uh, this is a concentration camp. Uh, Boy Scout camp was not like that <laughs> at all, <laughs> which is why some of us were able to escape. Um, uh, but no, what I was describing there is Thule Lake, you know, and that's, that's the kind of camp uh, that my mother uh, went to during the war. Uh, during that same war, however, the Germans would screw up the language. Uh, they built prisons with names like Auschwitz and Dachau, and they called them concentration camps, all right? So, you know, so when we hear that term concentration camp, we automatically usually think of uh, those uh, terrible uh, centers that the Germans constructed. But for the Germans, concentration camp was a euphemism. You know, it took what they were really doing and made, made it sound not so bad, you know? I mean, what's wrong with concentrating the Jews and the communists and the homosexuals and the mentally retarded and Russian prisoners of war and people like that? You know, we're, we're just concentrating them. We're just putting them where we can keep them under observation, keep them under control. Well, of course, that's not <laughs> what they were doing. They weren't concentrating them. They were liquidating them. They were killing them, massively killing them. Genocide. Uh, uh, so, so I like to use the word concentration camp in its original, narrow sense of, you know, that the purpose is to concentrate a population. I like to call the German camps death camps or extermination camps or something to emphasize that this is different. You know, the Holocaust is different from all the other wars, all the other camps. Uh, uh, when you are systematically trying to murder millions of people, that's different. It's very different from what happened here in America. All right. 
<clears throat> um, to manage these camps, the United States created a brand new agency called the War Relocation Authority, or WRA. Uh, the WRA built and operated the camps to which most of the Japanese would be sent. Uh, the War Relocation Authority was under the Department of Interior, not the Justice Department. All right, so you got the Justice Department, which runs internment camps where you keep aliens. You've got uh, the Interior Department running the relocation centers where you keep some aliens, but also mostly American citizens. Uh, and this gets us to our... Uh, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get to point four, but I'm going to try to finish point three here. So here are the camps here. Um, uh, up here in... Uh, Near Missoula, you have Fort Missoula, and Bismarck, near Bismarck, you have Fort Lincoln. This is where the, most of the 2,200 original uh, prisoners went. Uh, down here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, you have the internment camp where the Japanese diplomats were sent. Portland, Oregon is where my mother and father were born and raised. Uh, they, Portland had an assembly center, which was a kind of a temporary camp when, you know, where as soon as the roundup happened, that's where they went for several, couple of months. Uh, these were uh, ready-built uh, <laughs> uh, camps, uh, mostly livestock holding so my, my mother and father were in stalls, you know, in the Portland stockyards. Uh, if you were in Southern California, you would be sent to the Santa Anita racetrack, you know, which is thoroughbred racing. Uh, but, but during the war, it was a camp, uh, an assembly center for Japanese Americans. Is, is that a question back there? Oh, 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 yeah. To the, they, were, uh, they were left alone if they lived in Chicago or something like that because that was considered far enough away, unless you were one of those 2,200, you know, who was considered dangerous. But, but uh, away from the Pacific coast, uh, uh, you were okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, I just have a, oh, a quick okay. one. Did, did um, the executive order say that their um, belongings could be taken from them? Uh, well, I don't think it specified that, but in practice, you could take as much as you could carry. So, you know, you have all these famous photographs of, you know, little kids with two little suitcases or something. So that's how much stuff you got to take. Everything else you had to sell, give away, leave behind, whatever. All right. Um, so uh, my mother, oh, so they, they both went to the Assembly Center in Portland. My father got sent to camp in Idaho at Minidoka. My mother got sent to camp at Tule Lake uh, in California. They had separated? Yeah, although they weren't married. They didn't know each other at the oh. time, but uh, uh, wow. yeah. Um, uh, <clears throat> In several ways, the relocation centers were different from the internment camp uh, camps. First of all, they were a lot bigger. Tule Lake was the biggest of them all. It had 19,000 people. Uh, so it was like a small city. Uh, it, they were that big because unlike those internment camps, they took entire families, not just individuals. All right? So the whole family would uh, go together to camp. Now this taking of families is good in one way and bad in another. It's good from the point of view of morale. You know, if you have to go to jail, it's kind of nice to go with your whole family, you know. Uh, 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 so in that respect, they were better off than those old guys up at Fort Missoula in Montana. On the other hand, what's bad about the, uh, the, the relocation centers is if you take the whole family, that means you take little kids. You know, uh, about a third of the people sent to the camps were high school age or younger. So my mother was a senior in high school. She always resented the fact she missed her senior prom <laughs> because she was in jail. Uh, uh, most people go to jail after the prom. But uh, uh, <laughs> some of you may know uh, George Takei, you know, from Star Trek. He was four years old when he got put in prison. Well, I think there's something wrong with a program that you know, takes four-year-olds and puts them in jail. Uh, but that's, that's what happened. Okay, I, I, I failed to get to point four, but we have a few minutes, right, uh, for any more questions? Yes. I just wanted to point something out. I thought it was interesting. The second picture that you put up, the propaganda poster of the Japanese military. Right. It's for anyone that's interested or has taken some more advanced history classes or any classes on the Pacific or read the books. Aside from the obvious caricature of and the uh, simian-like posture, uh, if that was fixed uh, or corrected, uh, that actually the portrayal of the events that were happening in the background 
are actually uh, pretty accurate to what happened in Nanking, China. That's right, the rape of Nanking. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, it's almost impossible to overstate the brutality of the Japanese army during World War II. Now, if you're Chinese or Korean or Filipino or, or what, you know how bad they were. You know, and, and, but I guess my point is that my parents didn't do that. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Right. Okay. Um, Any other questions quickly? Um, please fill out the evaluation form. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Uh, okay.